So two months on now, the dust has finally settled. It's time to tackle this absolute beast of a phone, the Galaxy S23 Ultra. It's the best Samsung flagship in years, but it arrives at a time when a lot of other brands, especially from China, are bringing some serious heat with slicker designs, faster charging, and bigger camera sensors. So is the S23 still the no-brainer recommendation that previous Ultras have been? It's time to find out. I'm Alex Dobie, this is XDA TV, let's dive in. A common criticism of this thing in the run-up to launch is how virtually identical it is to its predecessor, the S22 Ultra. I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily, and we've seen it plenty of times before. The S8 and S9, for example, were basically the same physically. This is a big, chunky design, sure, but it needs to be that way to fit in a large battery and the S Pen. However, this is about the largest large phone you're likely to find. Even a lot of dedicated gaming phones don't feel as chunky as the S23 Ultra. And that's partly due to the flatter sidewalls this year, making it feel very angular, especially around the corners. And sure, the iPhone has flat sidewalls too, but that's offset by its very rounded corners. The difference this makes versus something like the Oppo Find X6 Pro, which has the same screen size on paper but with a very different design, should not be understated. The more rounded form makes it easier to reach across the entire width of the screen. That's noticeably harder to do on the Galaxy. I guess what I'm saying is getting comfortable with this phone compared to any other I've used recently has taken a bit of adjustment, but after that adjustment period, I've come to appreciate this big, beautiful screen that looks great even in direct sunlight. Samsung's in-screen fingerprint scanner too continues to be one of the best out there. Being ultrasonic means it doesn't need to light up the underside of your finger to read your fingerprint. This is, of course, a blazingly fast phone. Now, with Samsung phones in the past being in Europe, I've had to make do with the Exynos versions of these devices, like the S21 Ultra and S22 Ultra. These were often found to run hotter and perform worse, especially over extended periods compared to the Qualcomm Snapdragon variants sold in the US. It felt all the time like we were paying the same as our American friends, but being stiff with an inferior product. So finally now the S23 Ultra uses Snapdragon globally. And that just happens to coincide with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 being the best Qualcomm chip in years, especially in terms of thermals and battery life. As for the fact that this is a slightly higher clocked for Galaxy version of the 8 Gen 2, it's bragging rights for Samsung, but you're really not gonna see any noticeable difference versus say a OnePlus 11 outside of benchmark apps. Nevertheless, the new Snapdragon is a big part of what makes this Samsung phone so great compared to the ones I've used in the past, as someone who's been in Exynos land for the past several years. It was definitely possible to get my S22 Ultra running Exynos to get relatively hot to the touch doing pretty innocuous things. Not so with this S23 Ultra. And that efficiency also pays off in terms of battery life, where, like pretty much every other Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 phone I've used, it's given me an easy 7 hours of screen on time over one very heavy day's use, or two normal days per charge. Pretty wild to see this kind of improvement in just a single generation, but unless the manufacturer really screws up the optimization, that's just what you get with this chip and a battery of this size. That's helped along by one of my favorite features in Samsung software that I've talked about in a bunch of other videos so far. The light performance profile clocks down the high performance Cortex X3 core very slightly to preserve power, making it more efficient without noticeably impacting performance and while auto disabling when you're playing games. It's basically free extra battery life. So let's dive deeper into One UI 5.1 because this really is just one of many useful features that I've appreciated in the S23 Ultra over the past couple of months. One UI is overflowing with features, but in a way that actually makes sense. So many earlier Samsung phones were packed with gimmicky stuff that you'd use once and then never touch again. With the S23 Ultra, there's plenty to dig into, and the bulk of the features that are there are things that you actually might find useful. I've already got into One UI's excellent multitasking and windowed app support in previous videos, but all of that has made it across to the S23, and it works great on this large display. The Modes and Routines feature, formerly known as Bixby Routines, is another huge, often overlooked part of One UI. This is essentially a more user-friendly IFTTT, or Tasker, built right into the phone. With Modes, you can tweak settings like brightness, display grayscale, and which notifications to show, based on where you're going or what you're doing. Pixel phones have had a more basic version of this, but Samsung's really is much more fully featured. Routines is a more fully-fledged if-then programmable feature, and you really can build some powerful automations with this. For example, you can get as detailed as if you're exercising and a text arrives with a specific keyword in it, then read it aloud. There's an almost endless level of depth to this feature, and while I've only used it sparingly, if you're into customizing your device and automating things in your everyday life, you'll find a lot to enjoy here. 
I mentioned Bixby before, and Samsung's off-the-line smart assistant has actually grown one pretty impressive, though slightly weird, new feature in this latest version. Bixby can now respond to calls on your behalf via text-to-voice, in the event that you're not able to actually speak on the phone. It's a pretty situational feature, and so far only available in English and Korean, plus you definitely risk weirding out the person on the other end of the phone. So this is an ultra phone, and ever since the Galaxy Note brand was retired in 2020, the S Pen has found its home on the larger of the three Galaxy S devices. And while it's true there aren't really any new S Pen features this year, I have still appreciated Samsung's stylus throughout the time I've been using this phone. I'm not using it to take notes particularly, though I have signed one or two PDFs with it. Instead, I appreciate the way the S Pen makes everyday tasks just that little bit more convenient. Things like selecting a cropped area of a screenshot, or recording a GIF of what's on screen, or translating certain areas of apps or images. This is all far from essential stuff, but the added convenience is something you just don't get with any other phone. And it's pretty funny to look at how Samsung has just completely dominated this area of smartphone tech and made the S Pen their own. Otherwise, I think One UI deserves a shout out for its faithful recreation, or copycat if you like, of the iPhone's object selection feature in the stock gallery app. I haven't used it a whole bunch, but when I have, it's always managed to figure out the boundaries of what I'm selecting, so I can copy and share it directly with other apps. So you could argue that One UI has become a bit stale, that it's in need of a bit of a visual overhaul, and I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you. This current Samsung design language can be traced all the way back to 2018, which is ancient history by smartphone standards. But on the other hand, what's there basically works and looks good, and the latest changes to Samsung's wallpaper colour theming and widget stacks, once again borrowed from the iPhone, just make for a very welcoming experience that I feel comfortable returning to whenever I get a new Samsung phone. More than the S Pen or the giant screen, the big reason people buy the Ultra is for its cameras. And Samsung has taken some flack this generation because relatively little has actually changed on the hardware side compared to the past two Ultras. Sure, there's a new 200 megapixel camera that can capture a truly insane level of detail in its 200 megapixel mode, but in day-to-day -day photography, it's just one of the four cameras available to you. And even then, it's not all that different compared to the S22 Ultra in most images. The benefits versus the S22 Ultra are pretty situational, but they are there. The S23 Ultra has definitely gained some ground in very long telephoto images. Images up to 30 times actually look pretty decent, and even at around 20 times they don't exhibit the grain or blurring that you get from a lot of other devices. I'm not the biggest fan of Samsung's post-processing sometimes. I think I prefer the look of shots from Google's Pixel phones or Oppo's Find X6 Pro, which tend to be a bit warmer and less over-sharpened in the case of the Pixel. But let's not pick too many nits here. This is still a phenomenal camera setup, even if the telephoto hardware hasn't changed in a couple of years now. No one can beat Samsung in these long telephoto images, giving the S23 Ultra a unique advantage in situations where you can't get close to your subject. Think skyline or airplane shots or trips to the zoo or a show. I've had plenty of experience over the past couple of months of instances where I've captured shots that only the S23 Ultra would be able to make work because of its arguably excessive telephoto capabilities. Maybe you won't need it all the time, but when you can use it, it's amazing. As for the main sensor, I think it's fine. Is it the very best? Probably not, in a world where the Oppo Find X6 Pro and Xiaomi 13 Pro also exist. Those 1-inch sensors are game-changing, and Samsung throwing extra resolution at the problem doesn't always yield the best results compared to the competition. But here's the thing, with the Xiaomi phone you have to deal with that brand's highly opinionated and often overbearing software, plus a weaker telephoto. And as for Oppo, there's no indication that that phone will ever be launching outside of China. Elsewhere, I'm still a big fan of Samsung's portrait mode. The only device I've used that beats it in some situations is Oppo's, where its larger sensor behind the 3 times lens pulls ahead in lower light conditions. But still, even in less than ideal lighting, the S23 Ultra takes good looking portraits with solid edge detection around hair and glasses. In video mode, I've been particularly impressed with the S23 Ultra's stabilization. Thanks to an improved OIS module, it's able to compensate for a wider angle of movements compared to the S22. This is something you can really see in moving shots, even in 4K from this phone. Even when walking relatively briskly and holding the phone in one hand, the S23 Ultra was able to smooth out any judders, making for a slick video that looks like it might have been shot on a gimbal. And even in low light, the characteristic shakes around lighter areas of the shot that you often see from phone footage was nowhere to be seen here, provided you're using the main sensor to shoot, of course. And I continue to be impressed with Samsung's telephoto video. Provided there's enough light, the 10 times in particular can give you a unique perspective of subjects and landscapes that you can't get from any other phone camera. In darker scenes, admittedly, that 10 times does start to introduce a little bit of grain to your footage. 
I definitely think some hardware upgrades are going to be due in the next generation, especially around the secondary and telephoto cameras. Just look at what Oppo has been able to achieve with its larger sensor behind the 3x lens, and I think the direction of travel for Samsung is going to be pretty obvious. The Galaxy S23 Ultra doesn't do everything better than every other phone. Personally, I much prefer the hand feel of the Pixel or Oppo flagship, but I think it earns its place as the best all-round Android flagship that you can buy in the West. The boost in performance and battery life compared to the previous generation, combined with the feature richness of One UI and the unique capabilities of the S Pen make for some solid foundations. And the camera experience overall is still one of my favourite ever. Samsung's video performance has improved markedly, and it's kept its almost unassailable lead in telephoto performance that makes it a great phone for everything from a day trip to the zoo to a multi-week vacation. But I do feel like we've reached a turning point for Samsung flagships this year. The S23 Ultra is the natural endpoint for the design philosophy that began with the S21 Ultra, when it introduced quad camera support and the S Pen. In 2024 then, in addition to some upgrades to those secondary cameras, I think Samsung will want to figure out things like symmetrical bezels, under display cameras, and perhaps a way to make this excellent phone less of a brick so it's easy to manage one-handed. That said, for the here and now, this is a fantastic phone, and if you're buying in the West, it's hard to think of an Android phone that gives you a better overall experience. Let me know what you think of the S23 Ultra down in the comments. Has Samsung done enough this year, or are you hoping for more in the S24 and beyond? Subscribe for more comparisons and reviews like this one, but in the meantime, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.